this week on The Climate Show as we race to plant millions of trees. Who's looking after them to stop this happening? It's completely dead and thousands more along here have got the same fate. Hello and welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. This week, a glamorous location, a motorway embankment in Cambridgeshire, surrounded by dead trees. And we'll be asking why we're obsessed with planting them rather than making sure they grow. Also on the show, as the US proposes strict new limits on the levels of cancer-causing so-called forever chemicals in drinking water, we look at whether anything is being done to address the problem here at home. And with Monday being World Rewilding Day, we'll take you to a pioneering project in Kent as it welcomes its latest residents. But first to trees. Governments, companies, charities, councils are often falling over themselves to have ambitious tree planting targets to sequester carbon or provide a home for wildlife. But as you can see here, Planting them is one thing, making sure they survived their first birthday is quite another. The upgrade of this 21 mile section of the A14 between Cambridge and Huntingdon cost one and a half billion pounds, was opened in 2020 and resulted in the planting of 860,000 trees. Three years on, the traffic's running quite freely, but how are the saplings doing? No tree in there? No tree in there and no tree in there. No. Something like 70% of the 860,000 trees that were planted have died. So that's over half a million trees? Yeah. And why? I guess National Highways didn't have a plan. They have to consider what trees they plant in, what kind of place and what sort of uh, support and maintenance they provide the trees so that they do actually get established. Planting trees here is more than just a feel-good nicety. They got permission for this bypass, what's called a development consent order, on the basis that landscaping and trees would be put in place. And that is one reason why national highways admit they now need a replanting strategy. National Highways declined to do an interview, but subsequently published a press release admitting an unusually high failure rate among planted trees, and told us the cost of replanting will be around £2.9 million. That's taxpayers' money. Tree experts we've spoken to say the survival rate of new trees is a national problem, and it stems from an obsession with planting numbers, not least at the last election. 2 billion trees by 2040. The planting of millions of trees. Planting 60 million trees a year. Michael Downs is an arboriculturalist with 30 years experience. Maintenance is the key. Uh, you can plant a tree, it might cost you say 20 pounds out of 100 to plant the tree, but the other 80 should be spent on the maintenance because the establishment of the trees, that's the hardest job they do. The weather in the last couple of years, a dry spring and a scorching summer, have been tough for young trees, making that care even more important. So how do you ensure a sapling will prosper, not wither? What's the plan with it? Over there, we're making a small woodland about the size of a football pitch. Lovely. So uh, they'll be the first trees. Carol Honeybun Kelly worked with the Woodland Trust for eight years and is now planning a copse alongside a riding charity's new facility. So why the carpet, Carol? Well, this is a mulch mat or something that s suppresses weeds and keeps some moisture in underneath. But there is no point planting with that aftercare. Otherwise, you'll come back in six or eight months' time and it'll still be this. It's not as sexy to talk about maintenance and weeding trees and it's not as top line for your corporate responsibility web pages, but it is so important. And in your experience, is that aftercare happening? No, it isn't. What's at stake? What's at stake? Well, a bird's not going to perch on that. It's not going to work on carbon for you. It's not going to stop soil erosion, this little thing here. But if you look after it, if you plant it, and within two, three, seven years, it will be starting to deliver. They have to grow, not just be planted. They have to grow. Please grow. 
But will that happen, as even the head of the government agency that champions trees questions the political emphasis? Is the too much focus on planting perhaps and not enough on actually growing, surviving of those trees? It's easy to talk about planting. It's easy to talk about planting targets. Planting is just the start of the journey. I would like to see much more money put into management as well as planting. How important is tree planting and survival to our net zero goals? Very, very important. If we don't get survival, it's nothing. Planting trees is the most cost-effective way to manage carbon. It's absolutely essential. Planting rates are also running at less than half what was pledged at the last election. So fewer saplings with less survival. Bad news for our nature and climate aims. Now on to a big story from the US that could well have impacts here. And it's all about new limits that the American government is putting on over what they consider a very toxic chemical. This is something called PFAS. And the reason people are worried about these chemicals is they last so long in the environment and indeed in our bodies. And there's a lot of concern that they could be having an impact even at pretty low levels. Well, I'm joined to talk about this by uh, Zach Schaefer, who is from the Water Office at the U US Environmental Protection Agency, where he's a senior advisor, and he joins me from Washington. Zach, very nice to hear from you. Just tell us what are PFAS and why should people be concerned? Why have you put in these new lower limits? PFAS are a, a category of several thousand manufactured chemicals, actually, um, that can cause serious health problems if you are exposed to them over a long period of time. And now we, we continue to use them. They've been used for many decades because they have useful characteristics. They make our, uh, our pots and pans nonstick. They're used in waterproof clothing and firefighting foam and stain resistant carpets um, and in manufacturing processes. Um, some PFAS have been phased out due to health and environmental concerns, but there are thousands that are still found in many products. Um, and as you said, they tend to break down very slowly in the environment and can build up in our bodies and in animals over time. And what are those health impacts? What kind of things are we talking about? The science is very clear that, that long-term exposure to certain PFAS is linked to real health risks. Uh, the, the exposure over uh, a long period of time and at certain critical stages in people's lives, like during pregnancy or early childhood, can lead to negative effects on pregnant women um, and developing babies. It can weaken the body's ability to fight disease. Um, it uh, can increase risk for some cancers, liver damage, and elevated cholesterol, which of course can lead to uh, risk for heart attack and stroke. Now, we know no one's got any doubt that at very high levels, these can be extremely toxic. Famously, it was the film Dark Waters, came out a few years ago, looked at very high levels in a particular town where they're being manufactured. What is the evidence that they can have an impact on much lower levels and therefore, presumably, why you brought in these lower limits? Yes, uh, so the, that the latest science does indicate that uh, health effects can occur at extremely low levels, um, much lower than um, were previously known, and that's why we've proposed this rule. And I want to be clear that this is a proposed rule. It still has to go through a process here in the United States to, to finalize it. Uh, but uh, that science indicates that, uh, that health effects can occur at, at extremely low levels, and that's why we've set the limit for certain PFAS, for PFOA and PFOS, for instance, at four parts per trillion, um, and for four other PFAS at a, um, a, a similarly low maximum contaminant level. So. Uh, Four we, parts uh, per trillion. That is incredibly low. And I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, whether that's the kind of blade of grass in a baseball stadium or a football stadium, you know, but it, we're talking those kind of really difficult to find levels, aren't we? It is. And it, one of the reasons that we are setting the levels that low, of course, is that we, you know, we, this is for in drinking water. Um, and we know that uh, people consume drinking water regularly over the course of their day, over the course of their lives. And so we want to set a level that the science tells us will provide maximum protection based on the available treatment technologies and filtration systems available that will protect people over the course of their lives. So that's why these levels are so low. Because over the course of their lives, they drink a lot of water and it, and it could build up. Has anyone done any estimates of, I don't know, what, what are the, the health effects in terms of numbers? I mean, is this considered to be a sort of un, un, previously kind of unquantified health menace, public health menace in the US? I mean, do you suspect that thousands or tens of thousands of premature deaths might be down to this? 
So we did a very robust uh, analysis of the, the costs and benefits as a part of the rulemaking process here, which we do following the Safe Drinking Water Act's regulatory requirements. And we did uh, determine that over, over time, this rule, if finalized, this, these levels will save thousands of lives and prevent tens of thousands of illnesses uh, that would be attributable to these PFAS. We all want to protect public health. Uh, the science is clear that these chemicals uh, carry risks. We really believe that safe drinking water is fundamental to healthy people and thriving communities and that every person should have access to clean and safe drinking water. And that's why we're acting now um, to protect people's drinking water from PFAS contamination. Well, thank you very much indeed, Zach. And as we said there, these chemicals are not just linked to the United States. They're manufactured and have been used here in the UK as well. And we've got a report now from a couple of journalists who've been investigating at what levels they might be here, and they've taken to the water to do it. I'm Liana Hosier and this is my colleague Rachel Salvage and we are environmental journalists for Watershed and we've been investigating forever chemical pollution here in the UK which isn't as well known as the problem is in America. That doesn't mean we don't have a problem. We found it in the Thames here at Teddington and we found it all along the river. It could have got into the river in so many ways because forever chemicals are in so many consumer products and industrial processes. But we've also found it in high levels in sewage effluent. So wastewater treatment works will pump it out and it'll get into the rivers that way. In the United States, they've proposed lowering the a maximum amount allowed in drinking water to four parts per trillion. But here in the UK, they allow a lot more PFAS in our drinking water, up to 100 parts per trillion in the water. Here at the Thames, the water has been sampled and it's been found, a particular kind of PFAS was found here at 60 parts per trillion. Further down towards Battersea in the sediments down there, it was found at 5,000 parts per trillion. And it was also found in fish here at 10,000 parts per trillion, so you would not want to be eating you that. You would not want to touch that. <laughs> So it looks like the UK are basically trailing behind the United States and some other countries in regulating how much toxic chemicals they're allowing into our waters. Some good research work on the Thames there, but as we heard earlier, perhaps the critical thing is the level in drinking water. So we asked the government if they plan to introduce tighter regulations like they have in the States. And they told us that we have some of the highest drinking water quality in the world before adding, we are working at pace to assess the levels of PFAS occurring in the environment to inform future policy. They also say they'll have an update in the spring. Now, moving on, this week saw the budget, and this is what Chancellor Jeremy Hunt had to say about nuclear energy. Increasing nuclear capacity is vital to meet our net zero obligations. So to encourage private sector investment into our nuclear programme, I today confirm that subject to consultation, nuclear power will be classed as environmentally sustainable. In our but despite being low carbon, nuclear, of course, has some issues, principally what to do with all that radioactive waste. Well, our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, has been in Cumbria, discovering there are some plans to bury it there. The government is promising a new generation of nuclear power stations, but already highly radioactive waste is piling up. Now, Sellafield and 19 other sites around the UK are storing waste the size of six and a half thousand double-decker buses, and it's got to go somewhere. The international consensus is that it is best buried deep underground. And three areas along the Cumbrian coast and one on the east coast of England are thought to be the right area for what's called a geological disposal facility. And that's because the bedrock is stable enough to hold that waste until the radioactivity decays. Deep underground in a stable geology 
yeah, we can show that those environments have been stable for millions of years, much longer than it will take for the radioactivity to decay to a safe level. So we try to find those environments to construct our geological disposal facility, and that will be safe, require no human intervention uh, after it's sealed. It's not just the geology that will determine where this site is built. There has to be a willing community. And the Nuclear Waste Services, the government agency, is having a dialogue with these communities, trying to engage them to understand the risks and also the advantages. And they're holding engagement events. And this is what some of the people told us when we were there. It is important that there is you know, economic growth in the area and this would be a major you know, source um, for local people. And hopefully, if it comes here, that, you know, that will benefit. Uh, and I don't just see the benefit of the, the jobs, but it's the infrastructure that this part of the world sadly lacks. But not all local residents are happy with the proposals. One former science teacher who lives here believes that although deep disposal is the right way forward for nuclear waste, Cumbria isn't the place to do it. There's too much water underground and the rocks have got too many fractures for this to be stable enough in the long term. They all know that the geology is much better in the east of the country, where they could build a GDF that's big enough for all the stuff they want to put down it, and they could build it quicker, cheaper and better over there. But without the willing community, because they have no experience of nuclear. No. And that's... And that's that's the real problem with this whole process. Finland has already carved out a warren of tunnels to bury their waste and they'll start doing that in just a few years time. We are about 30 years behind that process but the belief is that they can engage the communities, they can find a geological site where they can do this safely and it is the long-term solution for Britain's nuclear waste. Now, after the break, we'll take you to a woodland in Kent that has just welcomed some new residents in an effort to make it a much wilder place. Welcome back to the show. Well, Monday marks World Rewilding Day. Yes, there is one. And to mark this, we've been down to a place in Kent where they're introducing more animals because they say more of the indigenous, original, wilder animals will actually help improve the habitat and lock up more carbon. They were famous in the past for introducing the first bison back to the UK. Well, Sky's Milena Veselinovic has been down to check it out. In this woodland in Kent, wild animals are slowly changing the landscape. They're grazing part of a rewilding project to turn this formerly commercial wood into a thriving ecosystem. We're using natural processes. Um, this is the kind of way, historically, that landscapes would have been managed with large herbivores moving through the landscape, rubbing up against the trees that you see all around us here, naturally coppicing. Um, species like the birch and, and, and the, the chestnuts that are all around us. We open up areas of, uh, for grasslands and heathland to grow through naturally. And all at the same time, the animals are depositing their faeces and creating habitats and microhabitats for invertebrates that, of course, encourages bird life to thrive as well. And to help nature thrive, these longhorn cattle roam the hills, sharing the wood with Iron Age pigs a hybrid between wild boars and domestic pigs. Wild ponies are among them too, and they don't mind a passing visitor, as long as there's a distance and we keep quiet. Animals here, like these ponies, have been chosen for their ability to shape the landscape, and scientists will be measuring their impact over time by sampling the soil and looking at how vegetation has been changed by their grazing and each species has their own special skills. The Exmoor ponies are a native breed, very wild ponies, that will move around the woodland quite fast, grazing and picking at different bits of vegetation. Our big, heavy, longhorn cattle, they're going to push through the undergrowth, they're going to use their horns to break down small trees, uh, open up the ground for wildflowers to come through. But pride of place is European bison, roaming 50 hectares of space beyond the fence in what is the first wild bison project in the UK. They love to punch through this really 
dense vegetation, opening it up and creating these light filled spaces, which again is really great for all different types of plants and, and insects and invertebrates. So everything the bison do, they're having an impact on the world around them. A world that's slowly coming back to nature. We're returning to our tree planting theme. Have you ever walked along your street and thought that patch there could do with a tree? Well, there is out there a tree sponsorship scheme which enables you to do just that and also encourages you to look after it, to water it as well. And why wouldn't you want to do it? A lime tree like this, fully grown, can store 10 tonnes of carbon dry weight. That's helping to fight climate change. The group involved sent us this. Hello, my name is Simeon. I run Trees for Streets, which is the National Street Tree Sponsorship Scheme. It's a charity-led initiative. A resident, community group or business can select where they'd like the tree to go using our online app. And if you've chosen to water the tree, we'll also send you a watering reminder every week during the summer for the first three seasons. We're at the Sherwood Primary School in Mitcham today, where one of our kind sponsors has agreed to sponsor trees to go outside in the street. We're so excited to have Tree for Streets uh, launch in Merton so that our residents can sponsor a tree and help to increase our tree canopy. I really hope that people club together with their neighbours and friends and, and, and join in in our efforts to green Merton. We work with councils up and down the country cities like Bradford, Bristol and Cambridge and in London here we work with about a third of the London boroughs. Tree Streets is all about empowering residents to make where they live better because you get to choose where the tree goes. Now before we go we've got time to answer one of your questions and Aliciana got in touch to ask via the Sky News app why is overpopulation not considered when discussing the climate? Isn't a growing population incompatible with a finite planet? Aliciana asks a very good and a very hard question. We have to start by acknowledging that carbon emissions vary widely throughout the world. The average person in the UK, for example, where fertility is already quite low, emits about 10 times as much carbon per year as the average person in Sub-Saharan Africa. Often, when people invoke concerns about overpopulation, they're thinking of the rapidly growing and high fertility countries that are predominantly still in Sub-Saharan Africa. But this is the region of the world where, again, the average person emits the lowest amount of carbon per year and that is affected the most by climate change when we think about extreme heat, drought, and food insecurity. This doesn't mean we shouldn't support people to reduce their fertility if they want to. We absolutely should. Relying on people in poor nations to solve a problem that they have contributed very little to and suffer the most from is not only unfair, but it also simply won't be as effective as people in wealthy nations reducing their consumption through the solutions that Aliciana raised. And if you have a question you'd like us to try and answer, scan the QR code on your screen right now. Well, that's it from the show here in Cambridgeshire. See you next week. In the meantime, I'm off to enjoy a lovely woodland walk. <laughs>